you know, give people a nugget that has value, but then provides the link to go deeper. And if you want to go deeper, then you, you have the full piece with the research, with the methodology, with all of the examples. So I, so I think a lot of what we're doing is putting these ideas into different packages on different platforms that serve audiences in different ways. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon and welcome to another Walker webcast. Uh, it is my great pleasure to have Adi Ignatius joining me today. Uh, before I dive into an introduction of Adi and then into our, into our conversation, uh, just a couple notes from having been on the road for the better part of the past week. Um, and I was back in Boston for my 25th Harvard Business School reunion. And so it's apropos that I have Adi on with me today to talk about Harvard Business Review and everything that he sees sitting in his seat. But a couple of things from that reunion. Um, first of all, I was flattered by the number of my classmates and other former HBS alums who listened to the Walker webcast on a very consistent basis. And to, so to those of you who came up to me and said how much you enjoy the content we put out, um, thank you. I'm glad that so many people find what we do on a weekly basis with the Walker webcast to be um, so insightful and uh, interesting. Um, the second thing is that the content at my 25th reunion, um, everyone was very pleased that it was focused on happiness and what we do with our lives. And Arthur Brooks gave this fantastic presentation about finding meaning in the back half of our lives. And I said to a number of people that that just means that we're actually now officially old. Um, and that they've given up on trying to teach us how to make more money or manage organizations any better at the Harvard Business School and are now saying we need to go figure out how to enjoy our lives, which was quite fun and the presentations were great. Um, I went from Boston to Chicago for a conference that uh, Sam Zell hosts every year with uh, a number of the most influential commercial real estate uh, executives from around the world. And um, I would just give a couple quick things from that discussion. Um, the first is a reasonably pessimistic tone slash view on the world we live in today, the rising interest rate environment, the high inflation, um, many people from a commercial real estate standpoint um, concerned about negative spreads um, on how do you buy a property at a three and a half cap and finance it at a four, seven, five interest rate and actually make money on it. Um, and at the same time, I think to summarize where the conversation went, it was someone's comment saying it is a stock pickers market it is not an ETF market. In other words, you're just not going to see all boats rising in a rising tide. You're going to have to be very focused on where you're buying, what you're buying, um, very similar to the overall capital markets and the equities that people are investing in today. Um, on the overall markets, one of the things that um, I haven't listened to Chairman Powell's commentary this morning in front of the Senate Banking Committee, um, but I would say that there are some signs that the 75 basis point increase and, if you will, the deceleration in the economy is starting to have some impact. Um, I saw this morning the spot price on WTI crude is down at $103 a barrel, uh, and all of the oil, both refiners as well as um, extractors, um, were down precipitously this morning. Um, and that led to a, a conversation that I had with David Faber at CNBC yesterday about the fact that the government and many people are focused on the supply of crude oil and that the real inflationary pressure right now is actually happening in the refined oil market, that the reason that the price of the pump is so high, the reason that uh, plane tickets are so high is that for every three barrels of WTI crude, you produce two barrels of refined gasoline and one barrel of diesel and jet fuel. And the prices for those three are somewhere around 100 bucks a barrel for WTI crude, 175 a barrel for refined gasoline and 275 for diesel and jet fuel. And that it's really a lack of refining capacity in the United States today that is causing the massive inflationary pressures for the cost of a trip on an airplane or for filling up your car. And that to some degree, the policy is focused in the wrong place. And until we get more refining capacity online, just as, just as we had happen as it relates to lumber price, 
Lumber prices were not were at fifteen hundred dollars per thousand board foot, not because we didn't have enough trees in the United States or there wasn't a bunch of trees sitting around in lumber mills. The issue was we didn't have the milling capacity to do it. And as we got that milling capacity back online after the pandemic, the price of lumber has dropped from fifteen hundred dollars per thousand board foot down to last I checked five hundred and fifty dollars per thousand board foot. So some of these supply chain problems are not actually the materials not being available, but actually the refining or the milling of them to get them to market. Um, just a couple thoughts. Um, so let me give a quick introduction to uh, Adi Ignatius, and then we will dive into our discussion. Adi Ignatius is the editor-in-chief of the Harvard Business Review. Prior to the HBR, Adi was deputy managing editor for Time Magazine where he was responsible for many of its special editions, including the Person of the Year and the Time 100 franchises. He also served as Time's executive editor starting in 2002, responsible for the magazine's business and international coverage. He wrote frequently for the magazine, including cover stories on Google and the 2007 Person of the Year profile on Russian leader Vladimir Putin. Prior to joining Time, Ignatius worked for many years at the Wall Street Journal, serving as the newspaper's bureau chief in Beijing and later in Moscow. Mr. Ignatius received a bachelor's degree in history from Haverford College. His father, Paul Ignatius, served as the United States Secretary of the Navy, and his brother, David, is a former Walker webcast guest, an editor and columnist for the Washington Post, and a dear friend. Adi, I want to I want to start with your upbringing and how and why two sons of a former secretary of the Navy became such fantastic journalists. What do you think it was that sparked that interest and amazing capability in you and your brother, David? So you're, you're softening me up. So I, I worry about what's to come. Um, you know, so, so there were four of us, there were four kids, um, you know, our two sisters, uh, both got law degrees. One is a judge in New Hampshire, the other, actually just finished a stint running. Uh, the first is my sister, Amy. The second is my sister, Sarah. I just finished a stint running uh, in Armenian. We're, we're half Armenian uh, descent, um, but a kind of scholarly research uh, center outside Boston. So I don't know. I mean, you know, growing, growing up in Washington, my father was part of the Pentagon. We would sit around and talk about issues. We were that kind of family. And uh, so it, it makes sense to me that we would go into professions like journalism and, 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 and the law. You know, my big thing was China, though. I fell in love with all things Chinese in college. And really what I wanted to do when I graduated was go to Asia and find a job wherever. And I sent letters to ev everybody I knew. And one crazy guy who ran a little publication called uh, Petroleum News in Hong Kong, not only was the only guy to respond to my letters, but actually sent me a contract, sign here, you come out to Hong Kong and be my news editor. So that's how it started for me. So let's focus on China for a moment. You um, edited a book called Prisoner of the State, a book about Zhao Zizhang, the former general secretary of the Communist Party who was sacked after the 1989 Tiananmen Square protest and massacre. Um, I think many of us who don't know China nearly as well as you view that act in Tiananmen Square back in 1989 as sort of the embodiment of Chinese tyranny. Are we missing a broader story by going back to that just one day? Well, I mean, that's not a bad place to start. I mean, you know, Zhao, look, from a, a Western perspective or from a, a, a liberal perspective, Zhao was the hero. Zhao was the guy who was, you know, trying to find a solution to this stalemate other than bringing in the, the, the tanks and the live ammunition. The extent to which the story was different, I mean, after the students, you know, if you think back, the students occupied the square for a long time. That's, it was a problem in Beijing, it would be a problem anywhere, but what do you do about it? You know, the logic of a communist state is you don't compromise, that if you compromise anywhere, all is lost. You know, is that true? I don't know. I mean, history maybe has, has shown that. And, and, and certainly in 1989, some of the revolutions in, in uh, uh, you know, in the East Bloc show that it's difficult to, to find that middle ground. But really, by the end of it, it was a power struggle. And it was a power struggle in the Politburo. And Zhao was on the liberal side and Li Peng, his counterpart, was on the conservative side. And they were both vying for Deng Xiaoping's ear. Deng at that point had no title, but everybody knew he was the real leader of China. So it was a power struggle that, that to my mind, and this is a little bit conspiratorial, required a massacre to resolve. And the day before the, the, the troops and tanks came in with live ammunition, things were actually you know, starting to dissipate on the square. Students were starting to go back to their uh, dorms. There were still people coming in from the countryside, but 
it, it wasn't a seething hotbed of activity. The government sent troops unarmed jogging in from the outskirts uh, into the center of the city, which brought all of Beijing out on the streets again, got everybody riled up. And then they came back the next day with live ammunition. So I'm not saying that they 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 manufactured a massacre, but I think at a certain point that that a violent resolution was required to resolve the power struggle that it that had happened at the highest levels. And Zhao had been promoting, if you will, a more, if you will, liberal or more relaxed um, response to it. And, and Deng Xiaoping came in and announced that he would impose martial law. When I when I read that, I was actually surprised that, if you will, martial law really wasn't already in place at that point. That was a significant shift in, in, in Deng's policy at that time. You know, they had declared martial law earlier and it didn't really take, you know, the the. the I mean, so another lesson is, I mean, the student movement really captured the popular imagination. I mean, this was all of, not just the whole world fell in love with the students. And, and that was, you know, it was one of the first times CNN was broadcasting sort of live around the clock when they could. So the whole world was seeing this play out. But everybody in, in China, everybody in the cities, it wasn't just Beijing, it was Shanghai, it was, you know, everywhere. People, there's this outpouring of support for the demands, modest really, that the students were making, but just standing up to a government that had never budged on 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 anything. Uh, so those moments in Beijing were were wonderful. I mean, it was it was, you know, my wife was pregnant. She was a journalist too. She was marching with the students into Tiananmen Square, and you know, Chinese would just sort of lock arms around her to sort of protect her body uh, as she was doing this. You know, old women would throw cartons of milk to her and say, tell our story. I mean, it was it was it was joyous. And I think people who had covered sort of war zones and, and protests before had a sense that this was not going to end well. And it didn't end well. Now, was that the only possible outcome? No, I don't think so. I think, you know, if Zhao had had prevailed in the in the power struggle, you might possibly have a more liberal China today. But he didn't. And, you know, now you have a deal that is a deal you know you you can make money in china but you have to shut up uh about anything political and that that's the deal and i think the fact is most chinese people would probably say that's a pretty good deal and on that deng xiaoping is known as the architect of modern china as you reflect back on the 25 years since you were there and living there what surprised you the most as it relates to their economic development either on the upside or the downside so there were many of us who thought after Tiananmen, that the, the, the center could not hold, that uh, the brutality, the massacre of, of people in and around Tiananmen Square was just you know, so horrible. And the, ice, the international isolation, I mean, it was sort of what, what Russia is facing today, that it would, it would impose such a penalty on China and that the party couldn't maintain itself. And I was totally wrong, and many of us were totally wrong. Um, you know, I, I think after a couple of years in the darkness, you know, Dung realized we have a problem and we need to liberalize the economy, uh, you know, in a serious way, but try to keep political control. And I guess it surprised me to the extent to which they've been able to do that. I mean, I think scholarship has sort of said, yeah, you do that, you liberalize the economy and there's growth and there's the rise of the middle class and middle class has certain desires and values that at a certain point the government can't continue to meet. And when that happens, there will be change either either violently or peacefully, but that you know no communist party can, can or no no one party state can can kind of maneuver that. Well, they have, and uh, really, what I was saying before, I think it's important for those of us outside of China to 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 know that people in China are happy with their lot. They're happy with their government. I mean, we look from the outside and we're rightly outraged by what's happening in Xinjiang by the fact that you know there is no free speech that lawyers who you know defend people innocent people are jailed themselves i mean it you know it, it's it's terrible but you know the chinese people are not sitting there seething hoping that their government topples you know they the for most people this deal you can get rich you can have economic freedom you keep your mouth shut that's that's an acceptable deal it's funny i i had dinner on Thursday night of last week with one of my HBS classmates, a gentleman named Will Chen, and Will lives in Shanghai and said exactly what you just said. He's lived there for 18 years. He said, it's just part of life. We're just used to it. I, I said, you know, 
how are you on communication? He says, I just figure they're looking at it and that's it. And I go about my business and do what I need to do. So um, that clearly um, to your perspective from afar, that was exactly what he said as someone who lives in Shanghai. Now on that, he also bemoaned their zero tolerance for COVID and said this whole policy has made life very, very difficult. And um, in Bloomberg, they just reported that there was a EU Chamber of Commerce survey uh, done last week that said that one in four European companies that is operating in China today is reconsidering whether they want to stay in China due to the zero tolerance policy, as well as a lot of other issues going on in the world. You and the Harvard Business Review have published extensively about globalization and the scale benefits of a global marketplace and global brands and things of that nature. Do you think that we're at a tipping point here, Adi, as it relates to more protectionism and regionalism, if you will, rather than globalization? Uh, possible. I mean, it's look, it's easy to say you're planning to leave China. It's more difficult to actually leave China. Um, you know, I think I think what we're seeing is that companies that are there are, are limiting the investment dollars they're putting into sort of growth as opposed to pulling out. Um, you know, yes, there are people pulling out. Yes, there are people trying to diversify their supply chains. China is just a really good partner. You know, I spoke to um, guys at Microsoft who make the HoloLens who were just saying, if we couldn't do it in China, we could not do it anywhere else. And, and you know, maybe that's, uh, you know, hyperbolic, but he just said, there's no replacement or it would take so long to do that. So I think, you know, China's role in the global supply chain, you know, will not sort of end quickly or overnight. I hope it won't end. I mean, I, 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 I see a lot of problems with China, but to me, the solution is not a, a kind of a, a, a full, a full decoupling. The COVID stuff, though, is a new twist, and it is just hard to get in and out of the country, and uh, so just the just huge inefficiencies for 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 foreign companies there. Is it a tipping point? I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I think we may be headed toward a foreign policy where we realize that people who we kind of branded as as not our friends or, or whatever need to be allies where we can find, I mean, this is my own bias, I guess, really, that, that, that I want smart people in the US and China to continue to talk to each other, to continue to find ways to work with each other, because this world is complicated. And, you know, nobody's nobody's all good you know and 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 everybody's going to offend some sort of fundamental value that you have but that doesn't mean you can sort of decouple from everybody you mentioned that it's a lot easier to talk about pulling out of china than to actually pull out of china were you surprised at how swiftly western corporations pulled out of russia after the invasion of ukraine yeah that's a great question um I, yeah i don't know if i was surprised but I, i've been fascinated watching it um the logic of sanctions is, you know, is sort of airtight and it's brutal. You know, it's, it, it's, I mean, so, so we, we have a partner, you know, kind of a, a licensed partner in Russia and they're great and their values are sort of, you know, free speech and stand up to authority and, you know, everything that you would want to identify with, but it's just not tenable for us to have a business in Russia now. It's just not, and and it's partly that because for economic reasons, you know, their economy is is going to be hit, and you know, it's hard to do business. But but for all the the other reasons that it's just not tenable for my stakeholders, for my staff, for my team, you know, to, for our subscribers to be doing business to 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 do business now with Russia, to be sending money, you know, back to the Russian state which in theory is financing what's happening in Ukraine, it's not tenable. And, and so, so there are a lot of unhappy breakups that we've had to do with partners we love because that is the, the brutal, unnuanced logic of sanctions. I have to say, I, I think back, and there are plenty of people listening today who are young enough to not remember this, but when Mikhail Gorbachev came to Washington, D.C. back in 1990, um, and sort of began the whole process of Western investment in Russia. And you think about 32 years of investment from Western companies into Russia literally evaporated in the course of three months. And it's just, I guess, in the context of that, Adi, what's your thought as it relates to Putin and given the position he's in now and having lost so much foreign investment, 
he can't unwind that. He can't get McDonald's or Starbucks or any of these other companies that decided to pull back to all of a sudden turn around on 32 years of investment. And obviously they all didn't go the day that Gorbachev showed up in Washington to meet with President Bush. But my point is just, he sort of seems like he's in a corner here where he's lost all the good that he created for this move. And therefore he has to keep forward with the war to win what he wants to win because he really has no other escape hatch. Is that the proper way of looking at it? Or do you think there's some other alternative outcome? So don't know. Um, you know, I think, I think, you know, Putin will insist that there's an outcome that he can describe as victory. I mean, just from what we know about him, you know, he's not going to suddenly say, you know what, that was that was ill-conceived. I'm sorry to, to the mothers of all the Russians. It, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, so I don't. So so what does the end game look like? You know, I mean, you, you could speculate as easily as as I can, you know, some sort of, uh, of you know, more formal uh, seizure of, of Parts of Eastern Ukraine and and you know that really come under Russian control and and so you know I could imagine an eventual scenario where war stops. Now that won't be acceptable to uh, probably to well it probably won't be sufficient say for the West to lift sanctions. Uh, so Russia ends that you know continues to be in isolation. And so I would watch you know what do Russia and China do? I mean you know you know the the East has emerged as an alternate market for Russian raw materials as the West has cut them off. You know, Russia and China have this axis of, I don't know what exactly, um, anti-West or, or, or something. Um, you know, I would be careful not to push China into a position where they feel like the only ally they have is Russia and that that becomes an alliance. That, that doesn't seem like a, a good outcome for the West. To, to push China or to contribute to China being completely out of out of the orbit. But I don't know. I mean, this is this is it doesn't feel like we're anywhere near that end game. And it, there's a lot of there's a lot of fighting still to happen. And it feels to some degree as if India is the is the one right now who's really helping support Russia. And they're not quite in that same position of being the pariah. I don't want to call China a pariah. They're, they don't have the same political pressures on them between the United States and India. And yet at the same time, they're the ones who seem to have turned their economy onto Russia so dramatically over the last three or four months. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know that's frustrating to U.S. policymakers. I think it makes sense to, you know, Indian officials in terms of India's self-interests. Um, and that's as far as the conversation goes. And they just haven't been willing to join as a symbolic or a, you know, a, a moral partner in the, in the, in standing up to Russia. So I'm assuming that you met Putin when time made him person of the year and went over and when you all were writing on him for person of the year, anything from looking back on those meetings and interviewing the, uh, Vladimir Putin that, you know, now in hindsight says, ah, we should have known that this was coming long ago. Well, I mean, the Putin of 2007 seems very similar to the Putin of 2022. I mean, he, what really animated him, what he spoke most passionately about, and even aggressively to us, even though we were journalists and not representatives of NATO or, or even the U.S. government, um, was really the, a sense of humili humiliation, a sense of lost pride, a sense that the West didn't respect Russia, that NATO uh, was being strengthened and enlarged to, you know, to hurt Russia, to, to hem Russia in, that there were Russian speakers, you know, ethnic Russians who, when the Soviet Union broke up, ended up outside the Russian border, and that these people were being mistreated, and that this was the real human rights violation. I mean, that doesn't that doesn't really square with with what seems to be happening, but that's the way he talked then. And that's exactly how he talked when he launched his most recent uh, incursion into Ukraine to protect Russians who, you know, in his mind were, were being, were being, you know, treated badly. Um, you know, that, that sense of lost pride, you, you just, you can't um, overstate it. I mean, at one point I threw out a softball question to him. I just said, you know, what's a misconception about about Russia that you would like to correct. And he really got agitated and was, was just talking about how, you know, you people talk about us as if we're primitive, as if we have, you know, just descended from the trees and have, you know, sand in our beards. And, you know, but it, it was this weirdly colorful, but, but clearly, you know, pained um, expression of, 
of of what it felt to be Putin, former KGB guy, you know, guy who would like to restore the USSR and maybe the Russian Empire, and what it felt like to suddenly be viewed as uh, you know, a kind of a, a, a lesser state, uh, an unimportant state. Um, and that's that's the battle he was fighting rhetorically in 2007 that he's he's fighting militarily now. You've met a lot of foreign leaders, and there's always the office to be impressed with or intimidated by. But was Putin as a individual, in, if you will, increasingly intimidating, just given his background and his own demeanor? So he was very intense, and and we all, you know, there was there were several of us who had come in from New York for this interview. We we're at his dacha, we're sitting with him. You know, we were with him for three and a half hours, um, and it was just it was intense. We we commented later that he didn't we couldn't remember seeing him blink, uh, and the only time he laughed was to make fun of a couple of us, in, you know, kind of a, a a biting way. So and we're you know we were Time Magazine, you know. You're, Half of what we do, we're trying to be playful. You know, what's your favorite sport? And he just, he just wouldn't go there. It was all very, very intense and all about, you know, this kind of pain and and and, and wounded pride that we were that we were dealing with. And uh, yeah, I remember our so our photographer. So we had the great Platon, one of the great portrait photographers of our era, took the cover picture of, of Putin and some of the inside stuff. And I remember he was nervous afterwards. He was like, are we going to get arrested? I was like, why would we get arrested? But it, but it, but it was just the, the kind of intensity just made him wonder whether we were somehow in danger. And that was, that was kind of the tone. Platon always has this um, device to try to get his subjects to relax because Putin gave him like five minutes to shoot right. a cover portrait. So, you know, Platon always says, ask people what's their favorite Beatles song because the Beatles are so universal and just it gets people's mind off the photo. And Putin said, of course, yesterday, which just seems just kind of so <laughs> appropriate. Did you appropriate. work that into did you work that into the article on him? Did yeah, we did. We did. Yeah. The perfect kicker. <laughs> yeah. So I want to stay on person of the year for a moment because it reminds me of um, when my mother was asked by time to go photograph Steve Jobs back in 1982 for man of the year. And um, they also sent a crew out to cover Bill Gates. Um, and there was the question of, do we go with software? Or do we go with hardware and time for the first time ever, instead of having a, at that time, it was man of the year went to uh, and then evolved to person of the year. But at that time, they went with machine of the year and they put the personal computer on the cover and had Bill Gates and Steve Jobs as the main protagonist inside the magazine. Time clearly called it right there, Adi, as it relates to not sort of saying Gates was going to be the image of the future or Jobs was going to be the image of the future. As you think back on all the various people and candidates that you looked at for man or woman or person of the year, um, what time miss? What was the what was the one that hit the, the hit, hit the editing table, if you will, and hit on the floor? And we sh it should have been person of the year. Well, I mean, the obvious one was two thousand one. You know, what, what is person of the year? I mean, it's it's the idea is the person who has affected the news most for for good or evil, and and uh, you know, and and in 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 past years, I mean, you know, times history goes way back. You know, Hitler was person of the year, and that never felt comfortable. So they put Hitler, but maybe with an X over his face or something like that, just to make it clear, this is not an endorsement, but this does fit the criteria. So 2001, you know, Osama bin Laden, of course, should have been the person of the year in terms of affecting the news, affecting the world for better or worse more than anybody else. And, I, you know, I don't think we had the I don't know if guts is the right word. Maybe maybe we had the good sense not to do it or the good taste not to do it. But the idea at this moment when the world was still reeling, you know, to put Bin Laden's cover, face on the cover of Time Magazine, person of the year, just seemed untenable. Uh, we got a lot of criticism for not doing it. You know, we ended up with Giuliani. I mean, that Giuliani at that moment rose to the occasion. It wasn't an insane choice, but I think, Plenty of people realized we had we had I don't know chickened out might be the might be the right word that it just it wouldn't have gone well with our subscribers it wouldn't have gone well with our sponsors it just didn't quite feel right in our gut but it was it was not the right decision I mean by the criteria we had set it it, it could have should have been Bin Laden 
Was there any thought to change it to either movement of the year or influence of the year and have it be terrorism more broadly than just putting Osama bin Laden on the cover? I, there might have been. I, you know, sometimes those general things sort of backfire. I mean, so it was, um, I think it was 2006 that we, the, the person of the year was you. And <laughs> it, it correctly, we correctly put our finger on the moment where all this, you know, DIY content was sort of happening and we were all creators. So, it, you know, it was, it was cool and it was clever. And, and the, the cover image was sort of a, a mirror thing. So, you know, you right. hold up the cover yeah. and, mm -hmm. and that people hated that. They just, yeah. Yeah. just didn't work. And, you know, we, we had a little, that had to have cost money. you a huge amount of money to, to manufacture. Well, so, yeah. So we, so we, we used that mirror stuff and we put in the editor's note that this was Kevlar. And the thing went so badly that, Ke the DuPont, which makes Kevlar, had us write a note that made it clear that is not Kevlar. Okay, <laughs> that is a different. We are not associated with this. That is a different, uh, a different product altogether. So I don't know. So sometimes those, those things are clever, but they they don't land very well with with readers. So in 2008, you were editor of the book President Obama: The Path to the White House, which contained behind the scenes photography by my mother's colleague colleague, Callie, uh, Callie Shell, Shell, excuse me. And as you think back on that book and the subsequent eight years of the Obama presidency, what one word would you use to describe the Obama presidency? Disappointing. I mean, yeah. look, you know, when he was- I led you, I led you there, but I was expecting something along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what else you could say. It was thrilling when he was elected. We published that book because he was elected. It was, uh, you know, he, he won the Nobel Prize before he even took office because it was such a thrilling moment. He was, you know, such a, is such a remarkable person. Um, but disappointing in terms of, of what was accomplished. I mean, I, look, my views are very conventional on this, but that, that Obama seemed, disinterested in the work that went into, that has to go into complicated policy making and working with people you don't like to try to, I mean, so so I remember not long after Obama was was finished his second term, I ran into Leon Panetta, who had been his CIA chief, who had been his defense chief, who had been Bill Clinton's chief of staff. And, you know, he just said, yeah, you know, all, is, he was simplifying things, but he said all Obama had to do was like, like some of these Republicans who, who didn't like him, and it, like take him out to play golf or give him a ride on Air Force One or something like that. That that just some basic politicking would, could have won Obama. You know, it, it could have strengthened the presidency. He could have been more effective. That may be a simplification, but I, I think he put his finger on something that. Obama wasn't very interested in that and, and didn't like to do that. So now the deck was stacked against him. I mean, the Republicans from day one said, you know, our mission is to stop anything this guy tries to do. So it's not like it's easy, but, but you know, the two terms were disappointing. So when now Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin was elected, I said to a number of people, he could pull an Obama. And by saying he could pull an Obama, my comment was saying, a newly elected governor, Obama had just been elected to the Senate for the very first time. Um, and so if you look at senators and governors as the, as the group of 150 of the most senior offices, I view the, them all in kind of the same bucket, if you will. And um, is there something that was unique, Adi, as it relates to Obama's ascendancy that will be almost impossible for someone else to replicate? Or is it fair to think that someone who like like a Yankin, and I'm not looking for a comment on Yankin, I'm looking for what was unique either at that time or Obama as a candidate that allowed him to jump from his first national election to being elected president of the United States. Is that just too big a bar for anyone else to jump over? And obviously you can't say never, but I'm just saying from your knowledge of all that, was that truly unique or could someone else go and pull it off? Anything's possible. I mean, you know, the the rise of Trump as a as a political candidate was in some ways, you know, out of the. I think when he started his campaign, you know, the Washington Post was covering the Trump candidacy in the style pages because they thought it was a joke, and before they realized that he was president of the United States. So, you know, anything's possible. I mean, Obama was a pretty special character, though, and and I mean, I always think back to the two thousand four speech that he gave at the Democratic National Convention where he said, you know, I'm a, I'm a skinny kid with a funny name. And then he just blew us all away. I mean, right. so it's, it's that helped. I mean, to have had kind of that under his belt to have 
suddenly, you know, arrived on the stage and people noticed and that that gave him a boost that was sort of behind the scenes and then sort of added it. But and he was in generally such an amazing speaker. I mean, I, I those days, you know, primary after primary uh, where Obama would come out and, and talk to the American people in ways we'd sort of never heard before, you know, sort of the 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 emotion and the passion and the poetry. And so, you know, there aren't a lot of guys like that. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, anything's possible. No, I like that observation. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't think the Democrats know what they're going to do in the next general election. Um, you know, nobody seems excited about, about Biden again. So something has to happen and maybe somebody has to come out of the, the woodwork and, and have a meteoric moment. Uh, and maybe it's, maybe it's income. We'll see. So let's switch to the Harvard Business Review. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I love everything we just talked about. I could keep talking about it for a long time, uh, particularly given the, uh, if you will, common history in Time Magazine with my mother. Um, so I remember when I was doing research on business schools back in 1990, and uh, the Business Week book on the best business schools started its piece on Harvard Business School, something along the lines of thump. That's the sound of the Harvard Business Review arriving in mailboxes of CEOs across the globe and the reason why the Harvard Business School brand is so strong. And so in that context, how do you view the HBR? Is it a, is it a marketing arm of the Harvard Business School? Is it a public record or consolidator of all the research that goes on at both Harvard University as well as Harvard Business School? Or is it an independent journal of business practices or all of the above? So first of all, we are 100 years old this year. Congratulations. Uh, so we're, well, thank you. We're getting ready to celebrate. Uh, I haven't been there the whole time, but thank you. Um, you know, so when, when HBR was set up 100 years ago, um, it, it, it was ex expressly done so then, it remains true today, that it's not meant to be a vanity publication for Harvard Business School. It's not meant to be a publishing arm of HBS. So it, it's really your last point. Editorially, our goal is to acquire and publish the most important ideas in business. And, you know, as it turns out, rightly, a lot of them come from Harvard Business School. This is a, a lot of really smart people there and they're doing a lot of interesting research, but that's maybe 20% of what we publish. So, you know, the rest is coming from people and, th and that's essential. I mean, for us to be credible, for us to have value, there has to be a sense that we're publishing the best, best ideas, best research, wherever they come from. And talk about that for a moment, Adi, in the sense that when you were at Time, you have a group of writers and you sit around and you whiteboard various things that they ought to go cover and you give them the authority to go and spend time researching something. And you've got also a timeline on it saying, let's get that written this week or let's start doing on a feature piece that's going to take you three weeks or whatever the case is. How do you manage the content supply at HBR given that you don't have a team of writers who go out and cover things for you? You're relying upon... Um, consultants at McKinsey and Bain, professors at Harvard Business School, as well as all the other business schools, and then industry uh, for content to put into the HBR. Um, so that's absolutely true. The, you know, my editorial team, they're editors, um, not writers. You know, very little of what we produce is, is written by us. So, um, you know, it used to be that I, I we sort of produced what we produce from the inbox. Stuff would come in and we sort of, sort out, you know, sort through it and, and pick out the best stuff. We're, we're more um, proactive now and we pay a lot more attention to, you know, it's, it's hard. Well, so we still go thump. All right. We have six print issues a year, but most of what we do is digital. You know, we're, we're, we're reaching 15, 16 million uniques a month digitally. And that's across all kinds of platforms. You know, we have I think 13 million LinkedIn followers. There's a whole lot of things that we do and, 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 and ways to do it. Um, but, you know, in many ways, the coin of the realm are still the sort of big think, you know, research-based pieces that, that are in the magazine. And, you know, we have a long lead time. It's hard to be newsy, but we want to be in the zeitgeist. We want to anticipate where people are. And HBR didn't used to do that. It was just a feeling that you got Fortune, you got Forbes, you got whatever that do timely. We'll do timeless. Everything will be, you know, relevant maybe forever for a generation and we don't want to that that didn't doesn't feel right anymore i mean in part because we're also digital and have the ability to deliver things quickly but also you know there's a fast 
fast-paced world and things are changing quickly and we need to kind of deliver information for where people are right at this moment. And so right at this moment now could be, you know, how to thrive in a recession or how to avoid a recession or something like that. Or, you know, the, the topics that people are really trying to solve now, how to, how to create and sustain a diverse workforce. You know, that has become an imperative, certainly in the U.S. in the last couple of years. So we have to be finding authors, finding research, finding ideas out there on these topics in a really timely way. So, so in that sense, it's, it's, you know, my job and the job of the editors here has changed a lot. So on that, the, I mean, I view HBR articles as being what I would call long tail articles. They're on all the issues that you just raised, but people's consumption of information has gotten, you know, increasingly short down to 140 characters or 160 characters, whatever it is on a tweet, I can't remember. Um, how do you manage that consumer drive towards sort of shorter and cleaner to the where the HBR comes from of doing really heavy research and rolling up your sleeves and having, if you will, long format articles. My assumption is the actual article length has gotten shorter. Is that a, is that a fair assumption or is, is it, if I went back a decade and looked at the yeah. length of the average article in the HBR, it'd be the same today as it was then? Well, it depends how you look at it. So basically in the old days, we only had long articles. So the average length of articles was, of course, long. You know, nowadays the long pieces are still pretty long. Um, but in addition to that, we're doing, you know, we're doing digital short, you know, 800 word digital pieces. We're, you know, we're very active on Instagram. I mean, the answer to your question is, I think, give people the nugget. You know, we send out a management tip of the day. You know, our, our Instagram feed is is really lively. You know, give people a nugget that has value, but then provides the link to go deeper. And if you want to go deeper, then you you have the full piece with the research, with the methodology, with all of the examples. Um, so, I, so I think a lot of what we're doing is 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 putting these ideas into different packages on different platforms that serve audiences in different ways. And as you've broadened the various media, um, has I mean, how important you just talked about the number of LinkedIn followers, um, you're talking about video, um, you're talking about the actual thump that goes out. Is it, at the end of the day, as you look at revenues to the HBR, is it all back to the thump? Or have those other new investments in a broader media platform started to pay pay back dividends as it relates to advertising revenue or general viewership? Yeah, so that's a good question. So you know, the publication business, you're getting revenue from a lot of different areas. Um, you know, in the old days, when I was at Time Magazine, it was, it was that was an advertising play, and I, you know, I think at our peak, we had whatever you know, four million maybe circulation. I mean, something crazy high. Um, and then you would sell ads based on that incredible rate base. Now you were churning 2 million of them every year. So imagine the cost of replacing 2 million uh, subscribers every year. So it was, it was a, you know, it was almost not a pyramid scheme, but it was a tough business to keep going. And at a certain point, if the advertising goes away, you're left with, you have a problem because you don't have necessarily a devoted subscriber base. Um, so HBR is different. I mean, we are all about subscription and, you know, yes, we have advertising. It's very, very important to us, but the main revenue and the most important relationship we have is with subscribers. We have 30, 340,000 paid subscribers now, you know, by far the highest level we've ever had. Um, so the, the relationship with them is, is, is paramount. So we have to keep delivering content. Look, HBR is nobody's first read. It's probably nobody's second third, fourth read, but, but so people come to us to solve a problem or to deal with an issue or to get sort of some sort of knowledge. So, so that puts pressure on, on everything we do to really have unique and often practical value. Like read this article, this will be an idea you can, you can apply to improve your career or to, you know, improve how your, how your company functions. Um, you know, so back to the, your revenue question, you know, at, so print ad revenue has declined. We do six issues a year instead of 12, but, you know, digital revenue has, has, has picked up. We do a ton of webinars that are sponsored and they're, you know, they're like this, there's sort of intimate conversations with interesting people and, you know, those are sponsors. So we, you know, we found ways to generate new, new sponsorship money as some of the traditional ones have, have gone away, but there is no relationship more important than the one with our, with our readers and subscribers. So on that, at the top of your Twitter feed, 
today or yesterday when I when I looked at it was um, a new book by HBS professor Keith Ferrazzi um, titled Competing in the New World of Work. And um, Keith presented this past weekend at my reunion and it was a fascinating discussion. Um, but one of the things that he focuses a lot on is remote work versus in-person work. And as you well know, Adi, this is kind of the issue du jour of everybody from Jamie Dimon saying you're back in the office tomorrow or Elon Musk saying, if you're not you know, back in the office, you're not gonna have a job at Tesla anymore. Um, are we, you know, it, it seems like everyone is debating this issue when it really is a personal issue in the sense that every company is a little bit distinct, every company's relationship with their employees is a little bit distinct, and the needs of their employees to deliver their product or service is all distinct, yet we all seem to be looking for this sort of homogenous solution to an unsolvable question. Is that a fair view of it, or do you actually think that the research is going to tell us that there's something all of us should be doing and we haven't figured it out yet? I think it, the research will probably tell us maybe what we, what we should be doing, but we definitely are not there yet. I mean, look, the, the, the most cited bit of, bit of research about work from home is a study that's almost a decade old, and that's you know, it was Nick Bloom and others uh, at Stanford um, who looked at a, it's, it's actually fascinating. They looked at a, a Chinese travel company, you know, there was like 16,000 employees. And and you know did this research where where a number of them were like randomly assigned to work from home and then others to work from the office over an extended period of time and then let's see what happens. And what happened, not surprising now that we've lived through this, is that you know productivity, however you me measure it, went up, absolutely up. And it was partly because there were no commuting times, but not just that. Product maybe people were working longer hours, but whatever. Productivity went up, job satisfaction went up. You know, so some sense of of your value, your work-life balance, something like that, they went up. What did not go up, and this is a problem, is promotions. So the people who were remote were promoted far less than their counterparts who were at headquarters. Okay, so that's instructive, maybe. I mean, that, or, or, or that's the type of maybe unexpected consequence that could come out of something that is producing good results in some ways, but, but you know, troubling results or at least something we have to deal with. You know, look, nobody's nobody's figured it out. Um, the there are plenty of employees who are leaving us and other people because they are finding jobs where they can be one hundred percent remote. And I think there are people who didn't realize that was important to them who now feel like it is essential in what they do. So that that's the reality. Once that kicks in, then you can think about all right. Well, if I have five floors of a building, then you know maybe I have people come in one, two days a week, whatever, and I can get rid of. A couple of those floors so so that is driving some of the the strategic calculation but mostly what people aren't answering is what is an office for and that's the most interesting question and you know the, the things we publish it's a tool think of it as a tool it's one of the tools in your toolbox it's not just a place that people go to work every day we're past that be th more thoughtful about it it's a tool so if it's a tool what do you do you have you bring everybody in and you have fun together, or you have hackathons, or you, you know, I don't know what. Uh, I think it was Nithin Noria, the former dean of HBS, who wrote a piece saying, think of the office as a clubhouse. Uh, and that's more, we come together to connect and to celebrate and to create and sustain culture, but sort of implying that work we can do anywhere, work we do, we can do from home. So I, I, you know, so you're right, companies are all over the place. You must be at work. We don't care if you're ever at work. I mean, that's the range. Our, we're in the middle. We have people coming in two days a week, but we don't feel strongly that that's the answer. We're really trying to figure out what what the answer really is. I think a lot of people are as well. That Stanford study on the Chinese travel company is fascinating. I was in California three weeks ago meeting with one of our clients, and I sat at lunch next to a young gentleman who graduated from USC two years ago. And so he's an analyst at this company. And I asked him, how much have you been coming in the office? He said, well, I've come into the office pretty much throughout. I mean, California shut down the office, so it was against the law for us to come. But the moment we come back to the office, I've been in the office. And he said he has two roommates, one who works at KPMG and the other one who works at ENY. And he said neither of them have even thought about going back to the office because all the big accounting firms are allowing people to work remotely. And I sat there and I turned to him and I said, five years from now, when you're interviewing for some new job, I can almost guarantee you 
that a potential employer will ask you whether you were in the office or remote, and it will potentially even become part of your resume, and that you having been in the office will stand a much better chance of getting that promotion and that new job than your two roommates who were at home in your apartment having a great time now doing all their work remotely, being very, very productive. And it was funny because he, you could see him sort of grin and sort of be like, wow, actually, I've been doing that. That actually might benefit me in five years. I just thought it was what I needed to do to be successful at the company I'm working at today. And so I hadn't heard of that study, but I can only tell you that as an employer of 1,500 people, I can guarantee you that at WND, a number of years out, we will be looking for people who are in and learning rather than being isolated and just being, if you will, very productive. That's fascinating. Well, and it may be that, that the people who are working at home would, even if that's clearly the case, will still say, yeah, that was, that was a fair trade-off. Yeah, very much so. No, I mean, and it might be, but I mean, I think also one of the issues here is in the professional services world and in the banking world, um, you cannot speak to somebody who's either in my industry or on Wall Street and not have them say the way I learned was through the, you know, the course of hard knocks of sitting there with my boss asking me to do something at, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I stayed in the office until 2 a.m. to get it done. But that's where I really learned. And I actually had a colleague to help me with the model and to answer the questions that I didn't know. And so much of that casual learning is not happening in a remote environment. And, uh, and so I'm not trying to be monolithic in my view of you've got to get back into the office because there's plenty of great stuff that gets done from home and you and I are doing a Zoom call here rather than me flying to Boston to do this face to face. Um, and at the same time, I do think that that point as it relates to promotion and career path is a very distinct one that many people in a very tight labor market today aren't fully realizing the implications of that. Yeah, there's another interesting thing that's happening, and that's so. So a lot of companies, ours included, are trying to, you know, and and, and this has become a bigger issue again since the murder of George Floyd. But are trying to, uh, you know, really create diverse, equitable, inclusive workplaces. And you know, we're sitting in in Boston, and you know, it's a fairly uh, we're seeing a fairly homogeneous pipeline of people locally. When we start to say, look, we can hire people anywhere. They could be based in, in New York or Chicago or wherever. That, that helps us with, with, with tapping into you know, pipelines of you know, diversity, is that word, talent. And, 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 and so we're hiring people. And it, you know, so, but then it's a question. So then we're more diverse on paper in terms of people's, people's backgrounds and everything. Are we more diverse as a culture when we're distributed and remote? And that is something we're dealing with by trying to, so we need to bring, this is the clubhouse idea. We need to bring people together physically on some cadence, even if it is to go to an island and, you know, do archery all day or something. Um, but it's because it's yeah, because it's it's a big challenge. And I, I if we weren't allowing people to work remotely a significant amount of the time, we would be losing people. I mean, that is just a reality now. If we were one of these companies that you have to be here, I, I think that would be a problem for us right now, at least with the, the type of talent we're 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 chasing and what the the options. We'll see, we'll see what a softer labor market does yeah. to those statistics once we yep. get to it. And unfortunately, from the conversations that I had in Chicago over the last two days at that conference, it sounds like that's coming to a theater sooner than we would yeah. expect or want. Yeah. Um, so you published a piece by Yale Eisenstadt from Cornell entitled How to Hold Social Media Accountable for Undermining Democracy. And I'm just curious, Adi, as it relates to how do you draw the line between business issues and political issues and, and the role that corporations need to be playing in our world today as it relates to either speaking up on these issues or not, and how much you're having your authors or researchers write on it or not. So it's a great issue. And you know, I think every CEO is wrestling with this. Um, to what extent do they want to they want to be activists? To what extent do they need to be activists? I mean, you know, 10 years ago, if you asked CEOs about getting involved in social issues or even political issues, most would say, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, you know, I'll speak out, half the people will support me and half my customers will, will, will be appalled. This is Michael Jordan who was, who was asked to be more of a kind of yeah. activist on social issues who said, you know, Republicans buy sneakers too or something like that. So, you know, that was kind of the prevailing view. Now it's not, and it's not just because CEOs are feeling more, okay, we need to solve society's problems, you know, feeling it passionately, but partly because, you know, the nature of this connected economy, the nature of Twitter, whatever, 
you know, silence is not an option. So if, if something happens, whether it's, you know, George Floyd's murder or Ukraine or something like that, you can say silent and just say, this isn't my battle, but motives will be ascribed to you by the digital masses. So you might as well take control of, of the message. And, you know, I mean, you know, you've heard this a million times, but people want to work for companies that share their values. Uh, customers, to an extent, they say it more than they probably actually do it, but they want to buy products from companies that share their values. So it, it, it's just it's just something different where in the old days, CEOs would said, yeah, and no, I'll stay out of this. It's just a different equation now. You know, for us, I, I, I'm not afraid of politics. What I, so in the, w- when Trump was elected, there were people who wanted to write for us just say, this guy is ridiculous. And I was like, no, I'm not going to publish that. If you want to attack a policy position and put up an alternative, that's fine. You can say, this is misguided policy. It's nuts. Here's something. That's fine. But if you have an attitude like, well, obviously any educated person knows that this guy is like, I'm not going to publish that. That's, that's not, that's not what we do. And, and, you know, I wouldn't support that. Now, we also have realized that there are certain values that we kind of believe in as bedrock values. So, so the point of HBR is not to make rich people richer. That may be a consequence of some of what we publish, but that's not why we get out of bed every day to do what we do. You know, what we do is to try to make companies, institutions, you know, more effective, more successful over the long term. And, you know, it, it's not just woke politics, but it's research shows that companies that are more diverse, companies that um, have a sustainability imperative, companies that are, you know, fact-based decision makers, companies that think for the long term, you know, are, are more successful over time. So, so those are sort of, to me, bedrock values. Now, they have became more controversial than I would have thought in recent years, but that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm comfortable if some people feel that that's, we're taking our eye off, off the prize and the prize is, I don't know, share price or something. Okay, fine. But, but, but this is what the research uh, is showing us are kind of essential, you know, bedrock values for, for long-term success. So two of your covers over the last 12 months have been one, build a leadership team for transformation. And the other, how good is your company at change? Uh, I guess the question that I'd have as CEO of a publicly traded company, you think things ever slow down? <laughs> um, I mean, there are academics who fight against this idea that the pace of change has never been faster, that that is always what we perceive and that it's, it's demonstrably not true. I just don't buy that, you know, it, or, or whatever. Maybe it's true, but and it's all mirage, but it sure feels like the pace of change is, has never been quicker. And, you know, if you look at, you know, what are the skills that, that people need to develop, let's say in college or early career to be successful and to be hireable and all that? I mean, you know, sure, things like coding and, and data analytics are, are important, but but you know the, the the number one sort of general skill is adaptability is is so that there's an assumption that the business model and the strategy of a company is going to be not just tweaked but sort of upended uh, within a few years. So you want you want your people to to be resilient and to be able to get excited about the possibility of change, to understand all this sort of you know digital design thinking stuff where you know we're going to iterate to the future and we're going to experiment and we're going to learn from it and you know so this stuff is is all about kind of rapid prototyping rapid change that it's not just for startups it's for you know established companies as well so that so that adaptability and 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 acknowledgement that change is going to come and 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 go with it and, and help help define what it is for your company is really a, a, a core skill right now. So, so, so I guess it's a long way of saying, no, I don't think the pace is going to change, but at least we're trying to prepare ourselves for it and to hire effectively for it. I will give a plug for an article in this month's uh, Harvard Business Review called The C-Suite Skills That Matter Most by Sadoon, Fuller, Hansen, and Neil as a really good article that summarizes many of the issues that you just highlighted as it relates to what the needs are for C-suite executives going forward. Um, Final question. This past weekend when I was at my 25th reunion, um, HBS professor Joe Tango made this fantastic 
presentation on his final class every semester when he teaches students where he goes off of what he's teaching them on entrepreneurial finance and uh, basically tells them life lessons that he wishes he knew when he was a student at HBS and now as a middle-aged professional slash professor um, has the wisdom to look back and say, boy, if I'd only known this when I was 26 years old, what a difference it would have made. As you look back on your career, Adi, what are the two things you wish you'd known then that you know now? Well, one of them was, um, I sort of thought money didn't matter. You know, I, I don't know how this happened. It may have been that I, you know, I went to a, a Quaker college or something, but you know, I, I just, I wasn't interested in money and sort of thought people who, who were, 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 were just chasing, you know, false gods. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not the type of guy who would ever work on Wall Street. That none of that is, is interesting to me, but, but I think I, I undersold myself and undervalued my skills for years because, because I, I just, I thought money was something, you know, you don't talk about and don't worry about. So, so that is something just a kind of undervaluing the, what money means both symbolically and, and it's, it's utility as a thing. Um, and the other thing, I guess, um, you know, as a young person, I was really sure about what I believed and, and maybe arrogant about it sometimes. And, you know, this moment, I just feel like I'm so sick of people's certainty and, you know, their stridency and I'm just sick of everybody's opinions. And I, I guess I guess I, I feel you know maybe guilty for 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 maybe being that type of person early. Hopefully, I'm not so much now, but um, I just I feel like we all need to kind of lay off. I like I'm not so interested in your stride, and it, you know everything's a hot take, so everybody's competing to 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 get attention with a hot take on something, and it 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 really adds to the idea that we're talking past each other. So so I kind of wish I'd understood that earlier as well. It's, I love that you say that as your closing point, because Arthur Brooks this past weekend in his presentation said that as he gets older, he's in this shedding process. And he said two years ago, he gave away 75% of his suits. And he says he's done really, really well with just 25% of his former wardrobe in making it so he looks okay. And he only really needed the five suits he hung on to rather than the, the, the 20 he had previously. Um, but the other thing he said was this past year, he really got ambitious and gave up on 50% of his political views. Um, and as I've repeated that, Adi, to a number of people, they've all said, well, it depends on which 50% he gave up on, on whether it actually was good or bad. But the point being is here's someone who used to run the American Enterprise Institute, who had some pretty strong political views. And Arthur's point was, I feel like I'm more understanding. I feel like I'm more loving. I feel like I'm more engaged with the people I talk to after giving up on those 50% of very hard and, and, and steadfast views um, from as a Republican and running AEI, Arthur had. And I just, I sat there and said, wow, if the former head of AEI can give up on 50% of his political views, maybe I ought to think about giving up on 50% of mine. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. really interesting that you say that. Arthur Brooks for president. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Um, you've been extremely generous with your time. I've loved our conversation. Um, thank you for taking the time to join me today. To everyone who joined us, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We'll see you again next week. And Adi, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, William. That was fun. Take care.